you for watching Urbanistica podcast slash talk. Today I have all the pleasure to have Fred as a guest in Urbanistica podcast. Well, I'm a bit nervous, uh, but I hope it's going to go really well. Fred has uh, his experience are almost double than my age, so I'm really excited about this. Fred is uh, together with Jan Gale. These two people were my inspiration to get to urban planning and design. So now I'm super excited and I will just leave the stage or the microphone to Fred Kent from New York. Hello, Fred. Hi, greetings. Uh, this is very exciting for me. Uh, it actually comes at a very uh, important time in my career because 50 years ago on the 22nd of April uh, 1970, I organized Earth Day in New York City. Wow. And uh, it began a long career of, uh, of doing something that I have to say, I never knew what I was going to do next. It was always an iterative process. And I'll show you how that progressed, even through today, how what we're doing now is way different than what we did three years ago, is way different than 20 years ago, is way different than 30, 40, even 50 years ago. So it's a journey that uh, doesn't seem to ever slow down. Yes. And, uh, it's, it's, I have to say, it's extraordinary. Yes. Uh, so part of that journey has been a family that actually, in a way, together, my two sons and my wife, Kathy, and I, um, we, my two sons, my oldest son at nine years old told me what I was doing. And the other one, and they grew up with me. And so they were free of a lot of the, the, um, of the kind of required uh, behavior, uh, so to speak, or going to a professional place and becoming a full professional. Uh, they they took uh, these ideas and made them their own, and they're now leading uh, the actual placemaking X. And Kathy and I are leading something called the Social Life Project. And so, Kathy is your is your lovely wife. Yes, and and longtime partner. Uh, uh, I could talk about her for a while, but I'll maybe at the end. So placemaking X just literally yesterday had a had a, a global call around with about 50 people uh, talking about the movement and how it's progressing uh, in every region of this world. This actually looks like the, uh, the, the uh, virus map. Yes. But it, it isn't. It's the, where these people are, where they're located. And they're all activists. They're all uh, pretty young. They're all uh, in the prime of their lives in terms of what they're going to be doing uh, as they go into the future. So it's actually a pretty amazing uh, amazing experience to watch this thing grow way beyond anything that we ever imagined. And, and uh, the term placemaking is a global term and it's being used worldwide uh, by many, many people. And in fact, over the last few years, we've been doing these uh, placemaking weeks. And there was just one in, uh, in Wuhan, actually, last year. Uh, that uh, you know, So a lot of people that are part of this network all know the, the leadership in Wuhan. And so they're all very curious as to how that's going. Last year, there was one in Valencia. And they're, they're all over the world happening. There was one in Chattanooga last year. But this is the movement, and the movement, from my point of view, uh, really started on Earth Day because Earth Day woke us all up to the environment, and it actually woke us up not just to the nature and pollution and things like that. It also woke us up to community and sense of place and sociability, and it connected me with a group of people that I call the golden age of research on public life. Uh, and where I started working with this man, William White, who set up the Street Life Project. And he was doing that at about the same time that Jan Gale uh, was doing his uh, Life Between Buildings work. So there were two parallel efforts. Uh, 
ours was much more data driven at that time. Uh, and theirs was more uh, experiential and, and observation. And then we switched, we flipped it, uh, and we've been doing it differently. So here's Earth Day, and uh, <laughs> I organized this. Wow. And it, it's the, the biggest uh, fake news story ever because <laughs> it was uh, on April, it was <laughs> April 22nd. It was the first day of spring in people's minds. Uh, we closed Fifth Avenue. The only thing I did was ask to have it closed. The city wanted to close it. They wanted to do something. John Lindsay was the mayor. Uh, it was a great opportunity uh, to, to showcase New York. And so everyone came out, million, maybe a million people, you know. But the real activity was down on Union Square, where we had this pretty amazing uh, event that went on all day. Uh, this was a two-hour event at lunchtime. So, but it, it, this picture went around the world and was uh, every newspaper in the world had it. So it really was a catalyst for uh, a really big change that then followed because it had the impression that there was a big following. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's sort of when placemaking got started. We didn't call it that. Uh, but what we're now saying, and I'm going towards the, to the end, is that we're now saying that placemaking is really the strategy for shaping the future of communities everywhere. And the impact on the planet is going to be extraordinary. And now with this uh, CODA-19, uh, it's even more critical. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. Yes. So um, there's some really interesting uh, evolutions going on. And the mayor of, of Paris, is one of those that's really leading a very different vision for the world. Uh, and it's not just about nature, but it's also about the places we share. And that's a really, we don't see that happening around. It's uh, the mayors are not into this yet. Uh, they, they will likely be get, get there. But I have been totally influenced by about 10 people. And I wanna just go through each one of them a little bit because what they said is the foundation for what, the work that I do, but I think it's the foundation for a whole new revolution in the way we shape our communities, the way we live in them, and the responsibility that we take for them. So this is a fellow who, who uh, started Visa, and he says we don't have a welfare problem, an environmental problem, a crime problem, a climatic change problem, population problem, an economic problem. We don't have an educational problem. They are symptom, not disease. The bottom, we have an institutional problem, and that's where the core problem is. And until we properly diagnose it and deal with it, all societal problems will get progressively worse. So there's simply no way to govern the diversity and complexity of, of our society today with these separatist, specialist, mechanistic 17th century concepts of organization. So that's the foundation. And that's, yeah. I, I think of that every day. And I just, I know that we've got to move away from that. And that's what placemaking does and what uh, it can do for everyone or communities around the world. So why we don't have better public spaces, it's fear, crime, narrow development goals, silo disciplines, project-driven versus place-driven, design-led versus place-led, and government structure and regulations. All of these are set up to prevent the natural, organic ideas that people can have in their community. And I'm gonna go through, through that. And when we started working, there were very few disciplines. Uh, and we could pretty much deal with the traffic engineers and transportation people. I used to say, whatever a traffic engineer says, do the opposite and you're <laughs> in your community. And we got jobs to train traffic engineers. So. You know, but then these others too, but they, and crime was an issue, was a big issue, but we would solve crime by adding positive activity to Bryant Park or Times Square or the Port Authority bus terminal. So we solved those problems by bringing positive uses and that became the foundation really for how we are in the last 50 years after. Today we have all these disciplines uh, and they're all, Terrific. I mean, everyone is really passionate. They're studying very hard. They're 
getting PhDs and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is that each discipline has become its own audience. And they have become silos where they have to be at the table for every kind of uh, transformation or change that occurs in a community. And if they're not there, then we don't get that kind of change. So in a way, what we had to do, placemaking became a way to create systemic change because it was really about doing things quickly uh, and a term we came up with lighter, quicker, cheaper uh, was getting things to happen quickly and grow them with the, with the uh, support of all these different disciplines. I mean, they're, they're all wonderful, but if they're just stopping you instead of supporting you, you're not going to go anywhere. And so that's why we, we will, we will say, and, and here the, the communities today are really about all these separate entities. They they are not next to each other. They're not woven together. Uh, they're not diverse. They're not multi-use. And uh, and so what we've got is a situation where, in order to change and get outcomes, we have all of these ideas that people in communities want on the left streets as places, architecture of place, markets, multi-use destinations, all of these things are what people are seeking and trying to have happen. But the obstacles are government disciplines uh, and institutions. And so terms like transportation and mobility is about moving people around instead of accessibility. I iconic architecture is uh, awards given by architects for other architects. Institutional buildings are largely obstacles. The disciplines are all siloed in their fields and government is determined by disciplines. And so we're not getting the kind of outcomes, sustainability, resilience, climate change, mitigation, a uh, healthy planet. We can't get them because of this giant wall between them. Yes. So what we say is we have to turn everything upside down to get it right side up, <laughs> to get from inadequate to extraordinary. And that's pretty harsh. But uh, we started using that probably about 20 years ago, and it kind of turned some people off. But uh, what we began to find is that more and more people would say, yeah, that's right. And they would try to figure out how to do it, turn it upside down and get it right side up. Today, I think this is almost a universal uh, realization that we really have been doing it wrong. And now with the, the virus we have, and uh, the lack of sort of sociability that we can, can, we can pr engage in, it's really a serious issue because we almost have a third catastrophe and that's isolation and loneliness and depression. So if you take that plus the virus plus climate, you know, we've got three pronged uh, obstacles that are set up that we've got to really overcome them. And, and, and we actually think that the idea of focusing on place uh, really can be a driving force to define the future. So we use this term, which we love, someone in our office had come up with this. If architecture is frozen music, then urban planning is composition and placemaking is improvisational street performance. And it's that improvisation that really creates the identity in a community, the ownership in a community, uh, the flexibility, the, the inclusion of, for people coming into it. It's a very uh, opening, it's an open process uh, that can really uh, engage people. But because architecture is frozen music and planning is composition, it's not working. It doesn't support this. So if we turn this upside down, and this is going to be the theme of this talk, uh, we're going to say that in the future, nothing is the same anymore. And if we turn that phrase I just used, placemaking is improvisation, that comes first. That's the community uh, shaping and defining their vision, their future. Planning is a vision, so it's taking the the aspirations and, and opportunities that people and communities are trying to attain. Uh, that's what planning can become. And then architecture actually becomes joyous because now they're working in the communities with them to help shape them uh, with the uh, improvisations that people are naturally doing 
Uh, and so we then get the future we want. And that is, this is the big idea, and I'll come back to this at the end. Uh, so it's really about convergence. Instead of having these isolated uh, institutions, uh, organizations, everything becomes multi-use. Schoolyards become multi-use. Parks become multi-use. Uh, transit stops become multi-use. Streets become multi-use. Squares are, are already multi-use, but they integrate the areas around them. So all of these become defined very differently as we move into the future. And that's, I'm going to, that's where the brunt of this presentation is going to be. So placemaking is a dynamic human function. It's an act of liberation, of staking claim, of beautification, and it's true human empowerment. Uh, and I, from my point of view, every human being is innately a placemaker. And we're all attracted to good places. We thrive in them, regardless of where we live and what kind of a community we live. Uh, and that people are deeply nourished by the process of creating a wholeness. Uh, and that's, so they're not defined by disciplines, they're defined by the feeling of being whole in the neighborhoods and communities that they're in. And that's what, what they can achieve if they're given responsibility to do that. So the wholeness is what uh, helps people to be happy, to be healthy, uh, and so on. So here's the movement, uh, Earth Day in 1970, uh, and then there were these people that I fell into, uh, not as a very young person, but I got to know them. Uh, many of them I worked with or spent time with uh, in those first years. And before we started Project for Public Spaces in 1975, I got a pretty good uh, grounding. And so these are the people. Uh, I studied with Margaret Mead. I worked with Holly White. Uh, Jane Jacobs was one of the first people I met when I started working with Holly White. Alan Jacobs, uh, you know, all these people are really the foundation of the placemaking movement because they were doing not academic research as much as they were doing observational research and, 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 and not trying to academize everything too much. It was more uh, just common sense. So these were uh, really prime people at that time that were trying to take a different course uh, for cities and communities. And, J and Margaret Mead said, and this, is, I've, this has been my whole life, you know, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Uh, and then Jane Jacobs, you know, intricate minglings of different uses in cities are not a form of chaos. On the contrary, they represent a complex and highly developed form of order. It is so true. Uh, trying to create order out of architecture and things just takes the soul out of those places. Uh, and defining things by disciplines, traffic, uh, defining how roads are used and so on. So she also said that the erosion of cities by automobiles proceeds as a kind of nibbling, small at first, Eventually hefty bites, the street is widened here, another straightened there, a wide avenue is converted to one-way flow, and more land goes into parking. No one step in that process was crucial, but cumulatively the effect is enormous. So the biggest obstacle globally are, is our transportation and street system. It can be 27 to 37 percent of the land area in a city. And how that is de defined, and if it's defined just for vehicles, you end up with a very, very limited uh, set of uses uh, in a city. And Donald Appleyard, uh, professor at Berkeley, he, did, he looked at how people interacted on streets where there was light traffic, the top one, and heavy traffic on the bottom one. It was revolutionary to find that, wow, if there's light, low traffic, people are talking to each other back and forth across the street. But in a high traffic street, very little of that happens. Uh, and then we were in Australia. We were in Sydney, Australia about 30 years ago and it came out of a meeting and I caught these eight women right in the middle of the street in, 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 on George Street in Sydney uh, and trying to get across a public display of affection. It was really a fear uh, but they did get across. I'm happy to say I almost lost my life trying to take the picture, but uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it was really, uh, 
this picture. And then the Lord Mayor of Sydney was in our office in New York, and uh, I gave him the picture, and he said he had no control. The traffic engineers were part of the, the pro provincial government, not uh, not uh, they don't answer to me. Yes. Uh, I have no control. So you know that was pretty revolutionary. Yes. So we came up with this phrase: when you design your community around cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. And that's what's happening to our street system everywhere in the world. And if you change that and you say, wait a minute, maybe we should design our community around people and places, we'll get more people and places. Right. But no one is doing that. That's not part of, of any agency's uh, responsibility. And, and that's beginning to change a little bit now, especially because we have no traffic on our streets everywhere in the world. People are beginning to look at the streets as though maybe we should do something different with them. Uh, than what we've done for the last 70 years, just piling more and more traffic onto them. It doesn't get us anywhere, and and we come out way, way less in terms of the kind of sense of place that we want to live in. And that's what I think people are finding today as we are going through this horrendous uh, virus, uh, global virus uh, epidemic. So, but then Alan Jacobs, who's, who was the same time as Margaret Mead and those people, he said we can develop and design streets so that they are wonderful, fulfilling places to be, community building places, attractive for all people. And we will have successfully designed about one third of the city directly and will have had an immense impact on the rest. Wow. So that was back in the 1970s that he wrote wow. that. But Alre people, Already. Yeah. It was all, all this was laid out back then. Uh, so it's, it's really, and then a fellow more recently is the Dutch traffic engineer said, if you want vehicles to behave like they're in a village, build a village. In other words, the village comes first, the traffic, and he does all, he did all this stuff on shared space. So that he took lights out and made it so that people made eye contact and there was cordiality and, and it was a transfer of power from the traffic engineer and the state down to the individual in the community. And that really works, worked and still works beautifully, but it changes the whole dynamic uh, in a neighborhood. So, and then Christopher Alexander, he, he did something called pattern language, which maybe many people know, but he also made this quote, said this about people are deeply nourished by the process of creating wholeness. So what I, my whole life has been seeing that people don't have that chance to create these kind of whole organic, dynamic, social, sense of place environments. And that's what they want. And when they have it, they thrive. And, uh, and so we're now right at that uh, breaking point, in a sense, people are stuck in their homes and they don't go out, they can't go out, they can't, it's, it's social disconnection is what everyone's trying to get them to do. Uh, which is wrong. It should be physical separation and social connections in the context of having uh, the physical separateness. So why can't you talk across the street? Why can't you be uh, six or eight feet apart and have a conversation? Why can't you smile? Why can't you uh, nod? Why can't you wave? I mean, these are all things that are social life that we all have and crave. And we're now told that it should be a physical, a, a, a social separation. That's the wrong language. So, and then you get Jan Gale and Holly White. You know, nothing in the world is more simple or more cheap than making cities that provide better for people. That is so true because it's so many little things that add up. It's the lighter, quicker, cheaper that make the place really work well. Uh, and then Holly White, who I worked with, he says, I end in praise of small spaces. The multiplier effect is tremendous. You can imagine this. If the more places you have, the, the, the better opportunities you have. There's so many things that wrap around this. It's not the number of people using them or the larger number passing by and enjoying them very vicariously or even the larger number who feel better about the city center for knowledge of them. For cities, such places are priceless, whatever the cost. They build a set of basics and they're right, right in front of our noses if we will look. So that was that's my whole career is looking, observing, understanding, and helping to shape uh, for people in communities. It's really community organizing. It isn't defined by a discipline. It's defined by creating the place that people feel whole and comfortable and alive, engaged, and, and, and their lives are, have a purpose to them. 
So Holly White, he was a, he was really good at creating phrases. And this is one, it's hard to create a space that will not attract people. What is remarkable is how often it's been accomplished. Uh, it was actually the Boston uh, City Hall Plaza in Boston, and it's exactly the same today as it was 50 years ago. Uh, and then he also said, if you want to see the place with activity, put out food. So one of our great pleasures is observing people eating ice cream. Uh, <laughs> and we take pictures and uh, there's one eating French fries. So those two are people go buy the ice cream and they all sit there. The problem in the guy on the left, he doesn't, he's not quite in unison uh, <laughs> with the, the other three. Uh, and then this is just an amazing picture because if you look at it, the only person that doesn't have ice cream is that little kid. And I said, oh my God, I said, this is amazing. So then I got it, I got ready. I took a next picture and there he was looking at me saying, <laughs> you know that I don't have ice cream. So, blah. <laughs> uh, so that was, I mean, that's, it, that's what it was. So, yeah. and then one of the best things about water is the look and feel of it. It's not right to put water before people and keep them away from it. Uh, and so when you get these places that people just can't stay away from, uh, they come and the joy is so great. And then this is wonderful because, you know, benches are artifacts, the purpose of which is to punctuate architectural photographs. They're not so good for sitting. So, uh, you know, and that's what they do all, all around the world. Uh, seating is just sort of the last thing people think about. And so there's a real... Uh, a desert of seating that that and people are finding this out now when they're walking more than than uh, driving. Uh, there is no place to sit, and so those cities that that are comfortable and that think about this are the ones that are going to thrive in the future. And so when you get a bench that's nine foot long and one that's four feet, it's very hard to get more people into a four foot bench than there is a nine foot bench. Uh, if you have movable seating, people will even stay in the rain. Mm -hmm. Affection is, is something that happens in good places. Uh, and, and that's always a sign that, that, that people are happy and comfortable. Uh, these are th three generations of women giggling on a bench that someone donated in a town in California. Uh, and when people really get comfortable, they take their shoes off. Uh, so these are all indicators of, of success. Uh, and even just rubbing your dog's stomach, uh, know that that's about, that's as blissful as it can be. So we say that when you focus on place, you really do everything differently. It's the place that is so critical and it's what people, where people thrive. And so how, how do we get that? So this is where, uh, Kathy actually wrote this book called how to turn a place around. And that was sort of a big shift for us because before that we were kind of thought we well we did thought but we were the experts on public space uh, and uh, when we wrote this book there were eleven principles and the first principle was the community is the expert and the second one is you're creating a place not just a design and the third one is you can't do it alone. And the fourth one is if they say it can't be done, it doesn't always work out that way. So the community is the expert freed us. And we really felt it was sort of like a, a uh, catharsis for us because, you know, you really can't be the expert in a profession. It's the community that knows what they want to do. And so when we put that out, we absolutely became bonded or bound by that idea that the community is the expert. And it just turned us into facilitators and resource people and community organizers and getting resources that, that we've gotten all along and what we're still doing of where people are feel good and where they thrive uh, and showing them that these are things that they can have and they can have quickly. So placemaking, uh, it, everyone knows it. Uh, and people are really good at it, uh, uh, except when you get into a profession where you start taking on another agenda that isn't about people, uh, traffic engineers and architects often. And so you're, you get you, you don't get that kind of holistic 
kind of process where all kinds of things coming together make a place comfortable. So placemaking is a community process. It's organic. It localizes its economic development, scale to each community. It creates social and place capital, and the outcomes are healthy, sustainable, and viable communities. And this, I won't go into it, but it's uh, very much, but the benefits of great places, it builds democracy and civil society, promotes health, renews downtowns and neighborhoods, it nurtures a sense of community, it builds local economic opportunity, brings diverse people together. Those are fantastic goals. And so that's really the goal of, 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 of everyone's place should be something like that. So when we started working, one of the things, this is a very old photograph, as you can tell, uh, with Holly White, I uh, did a study in the day of the life of a wastebasket there. Uh, and uh, uh, it was really quite ex interesting because uh, what happened is uh, is that a uh, uh, that wastebasket has a flat top with a hole in it, and uh, this I was taking time lapse photography, and this man came along with a newspaper, put it into that throat, and then about three minutes later, another man came along and pulled it out, looked at it, and didn't want it, put it back in, and then five minutes later someone in a suit came and just took it. And so there was sort of a recycling yeah. there, the way the wastebasket was designed. And then this, just a little further down the block, was this uh, antique shop. And you can see where the window is canted. So the people walking by on the inside were would see the window more easily. It was next to a bank. I went in there, and the man who owned the store, I asked him, said, you must like your, your location because there are 39,000 people walking by here every day. Uh, and he said, no, I don't because I'm next to a bank and people start walking faster when they go by a bank. And he says it takes them two or three stores to get back into a window shopping rhythm. Wow. That was that was a revolution. Yes. Uh, and I never stopped thinking of that. Um, and that's what the street looked like at that time. There were probably 20 businesses, uh, some on the second floor. Uh, it was as busy as it could be. It was crowded. And then what happened, like so many other blocks, it took the life out of it. It became that. So this became that. Yeah. And like my is, city. It's, it's, a, it's a disaster. It just takes, it means you come to the, into the building, but you don't do any of that kind of wonderful kind of street life, street activity. And there's a whole lot of other stories that I learned by studying that block. And then this in New Haven uh, was one that we were at, we were actually asked to implement and work on. Uh, and so this is a key corner across from Yale University. And uh, we put a plan together to widen the sidewalks. And the upper is what it looks like as they were doing the construction. And we took the corner and bulged it out and created a destination there. And Yale University is right across the street. And we narrowed the lanes to nine feet so that the traffic went slow. Uh, and this is what we ended up with, a great social gathering place right at the entrance to Yale University. And that, and then it sort of went down the, down the block. But that, that hasn't happened very much. Uh, and, and it really should be happening at every intersection. And then this is something that Kathy and I were in Munich and looking at the a market there, the Victual Market, and we started noticing something. We were there during the night when there was, the stores weren't open, and that uh, tree guard was there. And then the next day we came and someone put out these two boards. And uh, it was amazing. I mean, you could <laughs> see a, a more ugly, grubby looking thing, but people sat on it. And it was right between a uh, uh, juice bar and a soup bar. And so this was the connection between the two. And guess what? It's a great social place and people would put there, as you see, the, their drink between them and they wouldn't be there that long. So the next, so there's a very high turnover, but it became this subtle little thing that provided comfort <laughs> at a very high level uh, that no designer would have ever built it would have made it probably uncomfortable but this was what made it work 
Yeah. Um, and then the big, I'm going from that little, those little things collectively in a, in a market or on a street are what bring a, a street alive. And in Detroit, we were, uh, <laughs> we were involved a lot. I'm not going to go into it. There's a, there's a longer story, but, uh, this was the biggest change globally in the last 75 years. Wow. Without hesitation, nothing has happened at this level of transformation anywhere. Maybe except in Europe, where cities were totally bombed, uh, they might come back. But that was 75 years ago, I guess. Yes, yes. So, but this happened uh, 10 years ago. Wow. So Detroit in 1917 uh, was this. It was, this is one of the busiest cities in the United States. And this is the center of Detroit, streetcars, all this stuff. And that monument there in the middle did not move because in 1999, that's the monument. Wow. So go back there and everything disappeared around it. And we got that in 1999. Now, there's some things that happened between then and 2012. Uh, when we did a placemaking vision for downtown Detroit. And this vision with Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans, uh, he bought 95 buildings, and his whole approach was lighter, quicker, cheaper uh, activations. And he couldn't put any retail in the buildings. They were all empty. Uh, and so he had to work on the public spaces. So he activated the public spaces uh, on a lighter, quicker, cheaper uh, process, just doing things. And the first thing we did was a vision for downtown Detroit uh, in 2013. And we built it, or we didn't, but they built it in, <laughs> in there. And this is the result. Wow. It's just a phenomenal transformation. Um, and what we put in the center of Detroit was a beach. Uh, and, uh, and that's what it looks like today uh, and in the, at nighttime. And this is the beach around the monument. Uh, and these are the games. So this is all program driven. It's, you know, the, it's color, it's programming, it's Really, it's not a kind of high design at all. It's program, which is actually more design because there's so many aspects of all of these things, beer garden uh, and market stalls, temporary market stalls. And so this became the center of Detroit and Detroit is on a renaissance. And this is a renaissance like nothing anyone has ever seen in any city anywhere in the world. It's really quite, quite extraordinary. And this is Dan Gilbert playing with a, a local piano player uh, together. And then we worked on the rest of the downtown. So now we're, we're back, we're up to where uh, the, the placemaking movement has really been launched, and, uh, which is in 2013. And we set up something called the Placemaking Leadership Council. Uh, and, uh, and so now, where we are, and this is where we're I'm jumping ahead to where we are right now with something we call a social life project and placemaking X. But there, in, in all of our work, we have began to realize that there are key uh, activities that if collectively done can transform cities everywhere. Uh, and they really are a whole series of, of activations and there are things like bringing a public square back, using markets to strengthen neighborhoods, turning streets into places, applying design as a tool for creating destinations, spawning new community hubs, capitalizing on the appeal of waterfronts, expanding cultural destinations, uh, strengthening access, assets that express a city's character, and highlighting a community's identity by creating great amenities. So I'll go each, to each one of these a little bit just quickly to show you know, when you bring back the public square, we don't have a culture of squares uh, in the world. Historically, in Europe, there were squares because of the way the streets were, the, the cities were laid out. Uh, and today, we really don't. We use parks as the 
public gathering places, but squares are really the most important because they're totally dynamic and uh, and and program driven, flexible, managed, uh, and that's what we did in in Detroit there in Campus Martius. But we also did this in Harvard University, where this is Harvard Yard in the middle and Harvard Square on the left and the Harvard Plaza on the on the right. And uh, in one day, after 350 years without any amenities in the middle of the of, uh, Harvard Yard, uh, we put out chairs and tables. And so that was absolutely transformative. It changed the whole uh, whole feeling of the university because now people in the community could come in and sit, uh, and and it had become uh, co-ed. So there was. It was a totally transformation. And then we worked on this, which was an empty plaza and created uh, the square, which was um, highly programmed with food trucks and amenities and games and so on. So those are catalytic opportunities at a university and you can do those in a lot of places. So the next idea was markets uh, to strengthen neighborhoods. This is a really big deal because markets are incubators for small businesses for connecting people with other people, for sharing skills, uh, creating local jobs. And so you get these kinds of markets, and this is in Seattle, Pike Place Market, which is uh, a legend and a, an anchor in Seattle. Uh, and uh, all these things are going on, and it's one of those places that everyone visits all the time, and there are markets all over the world like this um, that are, our main centers of activity, but the idea of doing small neighborhood markets is one where you can really bring people into it and small jobs can be created and social action activities can be uh, heightened. And then turning streets into the places, I talked a little bit about this before, uh, repurposing space for people in intersections, street corners, city blocks, all of these things are game. The street should no longer be curb to curb, that the intersection building to building is what is, is available and how you design that and program that for public use and, and social gatherings uh, can have an enormous impact on the life of a community. Uh, this is actually in Buenos Aires where uh, this is a street uh, in the morning and, uh, and then during the day it becomes almost impossible to drive through. So it becomes the, the square, the neighborhood gathering place in that, in that neighborhood. And this is a place in London where beautifully designed, but the, it's not about cars. It's about people and people being able to be in the street and safe and comfortable. Uh, and how do you design a uh, neighborhood to be safe? You change the whole structure of a road. When you come into the neighborhood, you change it. Uh, you have wider sidewalks and there's so many opportunities and such a need for changing the whole way transportation is, is uh, 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 imply, in, imposed on us in our communities. And with this uh, uh, COVID-19, we're all realizing that, boy, it's nicer to walk down the middle of a street without any traffic than it is on a narrow sidewalk. Uh, and so people are, you see these little things going on all over where people are, want the streets back and not just this massive amount of traffic just destroying our neighborhoods. And then architecture as a, as a tool for creating a sense of place, it's really rare that you see really good uh, design that's human and that's human scale, that's social. And, uh, you know, one place is Miami Beach. Uh, where uh, you really, you, you, the buildings are, are, are fairly short, they're colorful, the, uh, the, the porches are set up a little bit so you can see down as people go by. You literally walk by uh, in the where people are eating. Uh, so it becomes really quite an experience for everyone. And it's that kind of openness that uh, really is good for the future of architecture and then new community hubs uh, in, in Perth, Australia. We took this uh, cultural district and we turned it into a uh, and this was done by a local uh, television broadcaster who was, had a lot of interest in plants. Uh, he did this uh, and he took this place in the lower 
corner there and turned it into that and the whole place was transformed with similar community uh, uh, activists that came in and took this cultural center and turned it into a major destination uh, in Perth. So capitalizing on the appeal of waterfronts, uh, this is something that's going on in many places in really rich ways. We just got back from Brisbane, uh, Australia, working on their waterfront. Uh, but Porto probably has the best waterfront in the world. Uh, it's on a hill sloping down. They're small buildings. They're not massive hotels and stuff. It's just a, a very kind of local, organic, incredibly interesting place that people come from all over the world because it's truly one of the better waterfronts anywhere. Uh, and then expanding cultural destinations uh, is a whole other possibility. It's wonderful to see what Paris does. This is a library that's on the banks of the Seine. Uh, these are exhibits that are right next to Musée d'Orsay that are on the water. Uh, people, they put out a blue blackboard and people are drawing on it with this very original seating. I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, now yes. Wait, wait, Fred, I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, can you speak? Yeah. Yes, now yes, yes. Okay, and this is uh, this is where uh, they put their art. They're obviously fake photographs, but people get a good sense of what the, the art is in this, in this tunnel that used to be a road. And then strengthening assets uh, for a city's character, uh, things like this. Uh, this is in Stockholm, but these kinds of... Uh, centerpieces uh, just draw people in and they do everything you can imagine rolling on the fake turf sitting on the lions uh, but it's a real central feature that just sort of makes everyone feel like they're all part of the same uh, large community uh, and so it's and then then just the idea of creating amenities uh, this is really probably one of the weakest things for most cities is that they don't really get down to this level and uh, these benches are fantastic. Uh, you can get all kinds of people sitting facing out or facing in, uh, or this, uh, where some of those people are connected and some aren't, but they're all sitting there uh, finding a way to make that bench work for them uh, face to face. Uh, and some of these places where we, we like to find places where there's a lot of affection. Uh, and there are there, I promise you there are places in a whole big park and you can go to some of these places and you know that you're always going to find something where <laughs> affectionate. So uh, it's, it's amazing how places organically draw people to the places that they, <laughs> they saw. So going back to this and as I close, you know, this is really critical. This is a big, big idea. If it's architecture's frozen music, you know, it's static. It doesn't have life to it. And planning is just sort of numbers and zoning and stuff like that. And then you've got this amazing thing going on where people are beginning to realize that they should be have some impact on the places they live. And so they're the improvisers. They create the performance that, that goes on on a street. And uh, if you turn that upside down, and here we found this fellow who likes to blow his horn, horns, <laughs> This is a big idea. So it's very exciting to think that, boy, if we do turn things upside down to get it right side up, we can really get from inadequate to extraordinary. And, uh, and so by turning that phrase up, by making placemaking as an improvisation first for communities to determine where they wanna go, planning then becomes supporting the vision and then architecture creates the happy music to let it make it happen. So if we say now that nothing is going to be the same when we come out of this morass or this very serious thing we're all in, uh, that's actually gets to be pretty exciting. So we can, if we want to, we can get the future we want. And, and that's where placemaking comes in. And what we find is we're always looking for the zealous nuts in a community and we're finding ways to breed zealous nuts, to uh, give them authority, to give them support, 
because vision, they're visionaries with a poorly developed sense of fear and no concept of the odds against them. They make the impossible happen. So zealous nuts are people who don't know what they can't do. And that was Dan Gilbert in uh, Detroit. And he kept doing it. He, lighter, quicker, cheaper became his mantra. And he would just do things and, and, and just go on and, and just keep doing. Had a whole team of people that were doing that. So every human being is innately a placemaker if we, if we recognize that. We're all attracted to good places. We thrive in them. Wherever you are, whatever culture, whatever income level you're in, people are deeply nourished by the process of creating wholeness. Uh, and so the strategy for implementation is you create energetic anchors of activity. We call it the power of 10. Do an ev evaluation exercise. Do lighter, quicker, cheaper. Short term, one to four months. Long term is two years. And you're never finished. You crowdsource ideas. And placemaking is community organizing. There is a convergence of movements now as we scale this up to get to the climate issues uh, that place uh, enhances all of these things. It, uh, an outcome of good places is environmental sustainability, is local food systems, is transportation, is preservation, energy and consumption, resilience, uh, society, civic build, civil society. All of these are enhanced by place. And the outcomes uh, support all of these, these movements. And then the benefits of places, these are the social benefits it's about identity, it's about interaction, it's about a diverse population, it's about health, it's about accessibility, and it's about local economy. These, these benefits are very powerful. And if you focus on bringing these benefits and realizing that this whole uh, outcome uh, has a big impact on climate uh, and sustainability and resilience and health, all these things, you really begin to see the whole picture come together that really the place, the place making, the place governance, the place led development is really the direction that we need to go in. And so going back to Holly White, this lesson that I learned a long time ago, so small spaces, the multiplier effect is tremendous. They're all there, they're right all with an eye if we just, if we just look. Uh, and so our our social life project, Google it uh, and look at this. The global catastrophe will be solved by local communities. That's what we believe. And we believe that's really the only way to go uh, to create a planet that we want to live in and be proud of in the future. So these are the organizations that we've set up in the last couple of years. Uh, they're global in nature. Uh, they're networked. So it's no longer uh, us as an organization, it's us as a network, uh, sharing, working together with people all over the world. And it is one of the greatest pleasures of my career to be able to very comfortably go anywhere and just find these enormously creative people, trying to do things, finding ways to help them, show them something, uh, report what they're doing. They're all over the world and they're all uh, working together to create a planet we want to live in and communities that we want to be part of. Well, uh, Fred, thank you so much. It was so inspirational. It's, to be honest, it's a, it's a treasure. These, this presentation is a, a big treasure. So thank you so much. And I would love that. I have so many questions and uh, I hope you have time to answer these questions. Oh, sure. Well, I, w I want to start from the beginning. What makes you think about the, the, the place? Why you didn't just went like all the other planners and traffic engineers and so on? Why you didn't just follow the flow? Why you, you just stand and reflect, okay, this is wrong what we are doing, like back in 50 years ago? Well, do you know the term flaneur? No, not really. Well, I just learned it about three weeks ago. It's someone who just explores and looks under rocks on round corners and here and there and sees them. And I just, I love that. I, there's nothing I like more. I like, there, there's two places where I feel most alive. One is in a forest on the edge of a field because it's so incredibly rich. And then one is a city where the life is just all around you. And so 
going to those two places are where I get the most uh, richness, the most uh, insights. And having now, in the last year, uh, started this social life project, oh, it's so wonderful because we're now going back. We probably have 300,000 images, maybe more, maybe four or 500, I don't know, whatever it is. But we're looking, we might have a thousand images of a market in Munich, Germany, or uh, a market in India somewhere. And, and we start looking at those and we see things afresh that we didn't see necessarily when we were there about how these places really function. So putting those together, like that incredibly simple little bench between the, I, I, we have a lot of those stories. And that's what makes that place rich and exciting. And, you know, without that, it would have been not anywhere near as good. So, and they do that every day. So it's that kind of creativity that you, you look for because you know that people immediately identify that intuitively as something that they are able to be part of. It isn't put the, it's not off-putting. It's just, I, I bet they don't even know that they sat there. But they did, and they had their put their drink on the, on it, and we, we can show you lots of those, and and those are the places that if you bring them in and you do ten or twenty of those in the community because you understand how a how a window display works and how you bring something out from your store, uh, there are just so many examples that bring life and and sociability and connections to people uh, that bring them make them live a good life. Exactly, it's it's the the story that the people want to create, not the one you wanted them to to be in. Uh, oh, right. no, that's why they're the expert. And once you realize that they're the expert, you're free, you know. Exactly. And, and you show other people what they have done in their community, because they're the experts in that community. So they made something work that reflected their needs, their talent. And yeah. so you're never kind of showing someone to someone. And saying, "Here, do this." You're saying, <laughs> "These people did this." Yes, and yes. How well it works. That's what makes it so exciting. And it's also in in the long run, they take care of of that yeah, place it's there. because they it's, it's it. there, their own. They they created. Yeah. <laughs> but right. tell me, like, fifty years ago, were you imagining that this movement is going to grow so big and worldwide? What was your like? Your dream, oh, this movement, I well, want to do it. After after we did Earth Day, we decided to try, we, we wanted to try doing a red zone in midtown Manhattan, taking all uh, private cars out and just have taxis. Uh, and we almost did that, uh, but that got stopped. Uh, we did something called the Madison Avenue Mall, which also was an experiment. Uh, and then then what happened is, we kind of lost all kinds of opportunity because everyone wanted to get into the public space design. So the professionals became the ones that drove outcomes. And the professionals drove outcomes that didn't really have anything to do with the people that they were doing before. And so they would build these big plazas and nothing would go on them. And they would build these, uh, these design statements and you know, and then, but then we got the chance to do Bryant Park. Bryant Park was not designed by anyone. It was programmed by people. And that's what we set up was the vision for the program because it was already designed. There wasn't anything changed except we moved some stairs back and we opened up some railings and stuff like that. But since then, it's probably the most programmed space on the planet and it's probably one of the best public spaces anywhere because it's programmed and managed you know it's a 15 million dollar budget to make it work uh, and it thrives and it's the heart of new york and so is rockefeller center which we worked on at times square and the port authority bus terminal so we were catalysts for these but other people do it so we don't really take credit we don't get into design award i don't we've never gotten a design award but we never why would we get a design award Yes, uh, because we're not. Uh, but we do have designers, but we're it's really program driven. And so that was what Detroit was, too. Detroit is the biggest success story on the planet for reviving a city. And who no one got the award except the developer because yeah. you didn't want an award either. Yeah, you, 
it was his he it was his passion. Thank so you. he was a zealous nut. That's his. So he was successful. Mm. Made a lot of money. Mm. So now placemaking or and the network you created or co-founded is more about sharing the best practices you're showing yeah. the world what could be done and uh, you already figure out this for so many years ago and i'm reflecting about myself i'm i was i study in the royal institute of technology in stockholm and also yeah. in politecnico di milano in milan yeah. to be honest i study urban planning sustainable urban planning to be honest the, the universities the system are almost the same as how it was. It's, it's not really about the community engagement and place making. And what I'm what I learned is to be honest, like from you and young Gail, from books and YouTube, not really from universities. So I'm thinking, how can we how, how can we add this to university? So it's the new generation just have it naturally doesn't need to go to YouTube and learn from there. Right? Well, that's that's how I learned. I mean, I, you know, those people that I got to know or spent a little bit of time with and studied with, gave me this amazing uh, kind of curiosity, I guess. Not a, they, they were never closed the door on, on, on something and say, you now know this. It's, you are experiencing this and, and that's what life is all about. And it's, I don't know how anyone could have more fun. You know, it, it really is. And it's so exciting to see people thrive. And so, well, everyone should be doing most of their work on the streets. And then, you know, that's why turning it upside down to improvisation and planning is not an architecture is happiness. And, you know, so that's how to, how to instill that as the future, not this, the ego, the iconic garbage that we get. Uh, so it's really a revolution. And yeah. maybe just at the point where it becomes what we all want. Yeah, but do, do you think that it, this should stay as a movement and network? Shouldn't it be like a more like official in the education system? I think everyone should be taking uh, taking programs where they go and observe uh, life in their community, where they can take responsibility and that they know that they can uh, help build a market, that they can think about seating so that they... At, at, at a young age, you know, they should be thinking, shown what it is that makes their community work and how they can actually be doing things in their community uh, when they're 10 years old or 15 years old. And so it's sort of like a life experience. So every school should be having that kind of responsibility in the neighborhoods that they're in. Uh, and people, and that should be a, a regular, I don't like the word course, but a a regular uh, experience that they have. Uh, and why can't five-year-olds, I mean, I don't mean five, but 10-year-olds yeah. or seven-year-olds go out and do some observations and start talking about what they like and don't like. Kathy did that with some, a school in Manhattan, uh, you know, many years ago, and they were brilliant. Uh, so that's the community is the expert. And once we get around away from being experts to being resources, and facilitators, that's that's what we need to train people. Yeah, and I, I love that you, you mentioned that everyone, every single one in the community can be a placemaker. And it's not really for the one who studied urban design or architecture. It's it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, but if you're if you are good at design and you start working, you can do wonders. I mean, designers are, are critical, but in the way of making people happy. And yeah. You know, and making buildings come alive. And why do we build? Why are we building museums which are in these monstrosities when they should be both in and out? You know, almost like warehouses and open to the to public and things going on and markets and creating the markets around them. I mean, so that everything is woven together. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fred, I noticed that also you're a great photographer, but also your pictures. Every single picture, there, there is a people in, in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Where, yeah. what, what are you? Are you passionate about making, looking to people, observing people? Uh, people's expressions are so powerful, and you, you know, when and I can, we immediately, Kathy and I just immediately sense 
where when we can get a good picture. You know, the joy on people's faces is if you want to show you cannot you cannot tell people something, but you can show people the joy, and that's that's the message you're getting across. The language, the writing is can be supplementary, but you know, and that's what Holly White did. He was helping people to see. You know, that was his his skill. He would show people what he would tell people what he was going to show them, show them, and then tell them what they saw. And wow, so that that changed their way of thinking. You couldn't see a movie. Uh, I mean, you couldn't see the same way. In fact, we went and met with Robert Redford once, uh, the the actor producer, and he said, I learned so much from the film because it was real. Yeah. And people know when things are real. So. Yes. And I was wondering why you're enjoying more having a network instead of organization. What, what, what's the difference well, for you? So different. It's so much fun to be uh, working with three people over here and seven people over there. And, you know, you're just, uh, uh, you know, we're working with some people who are in, in Italy now who uh, moved to Italy and are writers and urban designers. And they're seeing much more about the life. And so they're writing about it. And, uh, you know, so we're getting to meet, we're getting to be with people we love and not having to run an organization and get contracts. You know, it's so much nicer because we can get paid, but yes. uh, but it's not, you know, it's not, I don't need a $400,000 contract, uh, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we actually don't like to charge for our work because we're having too much fun. <laughs> yeah, and how, how is it, uh, before when we call each other, you told me that, uh, now you're home for two weeks. How is how is your experience about the the COVID nineteen and everything? Because this is okay. This is a a special time in history. What is your reflection? Because your 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 love is in the city. You you always wants to be in the city. Well, we you know we talked to someone yesterday who has a place out in the country, and it's on a rural road. And all of a sudden, instead of driving somewhere, they're now walking on that road. So they're seeing people they've never got to know before. And they're on one side of the road and the other people are on the other and they stop and talk. So even in a rural community, you know, you can create these social connections. And what's going on here is the same thing. Is that we're talking to people. It's quiet. It's peaceful. You can walk in the middle of the street. Uh, you make comments to people. Uh, you smile. You know, you start having conversations, I'll meet you outside in front. So you're actually getting more social activity if you kind of realize that it's just physical distance that you need to have. Not, you don't want social uh, separation, you want physical separation. So the social activity can go on uh, at a much higher level. Yeah. I, I just uh, have... A a kind of big question. It's like now when I'm working with urban planning in Stockholm, and I guess this issue facing many of urban planners, the municipality ask, how do I make money with the place making or the retail owners? How do I make money for, for them? It's about money. Not all, all, everything is about money, but like the first question is, how do we make money by place making? Well, I think you, I think you can, uh, create a whole uh, governmental program around community engagement and placemaking. And uh, there's a wonderful guy who uh, in Stockholm who was part of Munsterkorten. He was the empresario there. Uh, so he would purposefully bring people together uh, who wouldn't necessarily come there. And he would create diverse uh, multi-layered outcomes uh, for, for all kinds of people. So that skill in government uh, or a, a business organization can really bring so much value and life. And then there's all of the skills that are needed for tents, for cafes, for games, for markets. Uh, you know, there's so much. Uh, and when you look at Stockholm in particular, they do some of the best waterfront restaurants. They're floating on waterfronts. They're, you know, there's enormous design skill there that you just marvel at. 
And so that's a big part of it. And then for people who are designing buildings, you know, you can really design a building more about a program of uses so that then that they become alive. And if you're doing public space work, uh, there's obviously you need landscaping skills and you need uh, all kinds of skills. But if it's granted around multi-use, uh, you know, the, some of the great institutions in Stockholm do have pretty good use of the land. But, you know, and the whole Zur Garden is one of the, the, the finer destinations in, in any city. Wonderful. Well, Fred, I will not take so much of your valuable time. I want to say thank you so much for giving time, for inspiring us. Now, last question, I promise. If you summarize your presentation and uh, your reflection in three takeaway messages to the people who are looking and watching you. Yeah, uh, it's all about you, and your expertise and your intuition and your aspirations and your uh, excitement about your community and sharing with others how you become a force with other people as a network. The network idea is a really sharing idea where you can become part of something much bigger than yourself. Uh, and you can feel like it's part of your soul, it's part of your whole being. And you can end up with something absolutely foundational for your life. And you can branch out. There are a thousand things you can do. It's no longer stuck in one narrow silo, but you can be doing all kinds of things. And it's your skills and your passion that people come to to, to make use of, to participate with, and to sh share. So it's, a, it's like if you say you have to know what you're going to end up with, I would say you're wrong. Uh, because the journey is something that will expose you to things that you would never have expected and your life will be so much fuller uh, and so much more rewarding and your participation and presence and impact will be collective and, uh, and, and exceptional. So it's getting from, from inadequate to exceptional as a human being is really what can happen if you kind of let go and you use your, you know, your own innate skills to become what you want to become. Wow. So inspiring. What is the next tip for you now? Oh, we have a hundred stories to write and video and, and, uh, uh, and uh, images and good writing. And there's just so many amazing things that we can show. And so people should look at the Social Life Project website and Placemaking X, because we're gonna see this kind of uh, renaissance of, of really creative things that people are doing that, uh, that will inspire people around the world. So yeah. that social life to us is sort of the foundation for life on the planet. Yes, amazing. So Thank you so much, Fred, sure. for, for everything you shared with us, for your magic, for your inspiration and experience. Yep. Thank you very much. And yeah. thank you for watching uh, Urbanistica Talks or listening to Urbanistica Podcast. Uh, don't forget to follow on Instagram and uh, subscribe the YouTube channel. And also don't forget to check in Place Making X and the uh, Social Life Project. I am Mustafa Sharif from Stockholm. Have a good life.